Hey, welcome to LearnControlSystems.com. Uh, in this video, we're going to discuss what exactly you should expect on the CSE exam and um, what would be on the CAP and the CCST3. Uh, kind of give you a heads up of what to study for. Um, we'll be covering, first we'll review process measurement standards and terminology. Um, in doing so, what we're going to do is not just uh, the measurement standards terminology, but what a process is, what we're trying to accomplish, different type of processes. We'll look at different kind of process plants. Uh, we'll look at, you know, petrochemical, chemical, pharmaceutical. We'll look at uh, power and pulp. Uh, we'll look at um, things like boiler houses and uh, electrical power plants and how we generate electric. And all these use basically the same instrumentation and controls. Um, when we get into food processing, uh, whether it be Procter & Gamble or making a, um, semiconductor chips like a TI, all these use the basic same processes to control. Uh, same kind of controllers, same kind of valves, same kind of measurements, uh, same applications. So it's, it's not, it's, some people take this exam and think it's just petrochemical. It's not petrochemical. This is very diverse and it's, it covers a, a wide range of markets and uh, if you become uh, fairly good at understanding all the fundamentals. You can work in uh, many, many aspects of engineering and diversified markets. It's very valuable. So, after we understand what, what a process plan is and what we're trying to accomplish and how we control these plants as an overview, first thing we have to do is look at the fluid mechanics and fundamental physics. We have to review these. So, without understanding uh, at least a solid beginning understanding of fluid mechanics, it's very difficult to understand what's happening with pressure measurement and flow measurement and level measurements. These are all physics based on fluids. Uh, even our mass flow will be based on fluid mechanics and some introductory uh, thermodynamics. Let's both cover a little bit of thermodynamics. Uh, it's all simple, straightforward, real simple. Uh, and, and we use this and, and when we discuss it and we start applying it, you find out it's, it's, it's very easy to understand and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When it comes to instrumentation and understanding how to do process control measurement, uh, now this doesn't apply to all plants and manufacturing systems, only in process control, uh, even though it is uh, does span some other disciplines. The first thing you're going to talk about is weight. And we'll look at weight and force. And weight, of course, is force. We get mass times acceleration during its force, and of course, force over distance is work. Everything is based on differential force or differential work, and these differential forces can we can use those to calculate how much work's being done. And obviously, you need to understand how this works. We're here to make money. Everybody's here to make a profit, make money, and this is all based on work. Just like you want to get paid for doing work. Uh, we have to put work into this equipment. It does work on a process, and we add value to the process by doing work on the process, and we need to make our money, and we need to make a profit. Not only do we get make our wages back, we need to make a profit. Um, the whole idea is just to get ahead. So we want to minimize any losses, uh, maximize the most output we can for the minimal amount of money, and we want the largest return on investment we can get. Okay, to do this, we'll, we'll have broken into study groups. Uh, what we just talked about is study group one. Study group two will cover fundamental measurements, temperature measurement and how to calibrate, how temperature measurements are made, uh, and how we utilize these temperature measurements, uh, how we send these signals. Uh, we'll look at pressure measurement, what is pressure, and different types of pressure and applications of pressure measurements. Then we'll look at level measurements. And of course, level measurements are all based on pressure. Uh, and from our fluid mechanics, we'll find out it's based on head and work and force. And it's actually based on how high uh, a mass is falling towards the earth and being accelerated. It's typical, our typical measurement. We, we raise a, something up to a level, give it potential energy, it falls down, the higher it is, the faster it goes, and of course mass time acceleration equals force, so the higher it is, the more force we can generate when it hits the ground. This is the way a pump works, 
This is how we measure our levels uh, in tanks or flow measurements. Next we'll go into flow measurement. We're going to use this differential of height of falling to give us um, a difference of force. This difference of force is proportional to how high we've fallen and we know the velocity is uh, velocity squared equals 2g height. So we use that. We also use um, for mass flow we use gamma radiation to measure the density how dense uh, our process is going through and we can use that to get mass as well. Group 3 we're going to look at weight measurement and calibration. Then we'll look at process analyzers. Then we'll look at process control valves and how to size process control valves. Uh, we'll introduce process control valves. We'll come into process more advanced applications of process control valves uh, later and after process control theory and control tuning because your process control valves make uh, a world of difference um, based on your pressure in your system. And it's, again, we have to understand our fluids because if we don't understand the pressures in our system, uh, we won't get the proper pressure differential across our valve. And it's the pressure differential times area equals force. Again, it's a driving force that accelerates the fluid. And uh, we have to talk about what the pressure is. Too much pressure uh, will actually cause it to stagnate and it won't, uh, it won't flow through the valve. So we have to understand that. We have to understand about pressure building up in vessels and pipes and too much pressure due to clogs or whatever. Uh, this can uh, cause vessels and pipes to explode and gaskets to blow out. Um, you got to understand you say like 15 psi, oh, that ain't nothing. You know, what's 15 psi? Well you take 15 psi and you multiply that times uh, you know, 100,000 square inches. So you got 1.5 million pounds of force. Okay. So you just actually just blow the top right off the tank. So we have to have pressure relief uh, to make sure this doesn't happen. Blow out the bottom of the tanks and the product will run into the ground. Um, and we'll discuss ways to check for that. Um, then our next group we'll move to is group four. We'll look at a review of uh, feedback control fundamentals. Uh, exactly what is feedback control? How do we utilize feedback control? Uh, not only review of feedback, we're going to look at feed forward and techniques of uh, controlling loops. Uh, we'll look at disturbances coming in and how to compensate for those disturbances. Like uh, we have a temperature and we have a hot product coming through a pipe and then a cold wind comes in. Well, we get a furnace heating it up. We get a, a, a hot uh, um, product coming out and cold comes in, cools down during the day. We go from 8 degrees down to 32 degrees in one day. You know, a freak storm comes in. All of a sudden your product coming in is cold. The furnace can't heat it up as much. The product is cold coming out. It won't work in the process. We've got to learn how to understand we're too cold and accelerate the heat above what would be normal to have it at the right temperature when it gets there. But the process won't work. We'll look at all the kind of uh, applications of feedback control and how to uh, make them respond faster. Um, then, then we'll look at uh, frequency response and we'll talk a little about frequency response and what frequency response is. Uh, we don't talk about like you would in control theory in a college. Uh, in a college they talk about you know tuning and oscillations and uh, that's true but uh, you're typically sitting there on a computer and MATLAB and, and you're putting in some equation you're watching it well you're watching it dive down and die off with your body plot um, and you don't really grasp what it is or you get a, some kind of mass on the motor you know, wah, 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 wah. in here we got valves that move these valves move they're changing a resistance of flow you get these big tanks that are filling up, and we're trying to maintain these levels. Well, it sounds easy, but when you start running in a continuous process, we have several processes in front of us. We have a couple processes after us, and when these mess up, it it just kind of avalanches. It just propagates through the system, and then you got disturbances here, and you're trying to maintain this level as this drops off, and then this is adding changing here, which is adding that one. And all these start oscillating back and forth, and we're trying to get them in as tight as we can to keep the product where we want. And it, it comes down to literally an RC time constant, basically, with uh, capacitance in the tank, uh, resistance and inductance in the pipe, and resistance in our valve. And our valve will be a variable resistor, which will set a varying time constant, which changes the rise time, settling time, 
and what kind of oscillation we have because it has dampening. Uh, so where we place the valve is kind of important. Um, how we attenuate and what it means, we need to look at that and understand what that is and slew rates, how quickly we can respond, how quickly a frequency can respond. Uh, if something's oscillating too much, how to cancel that frequency out with low pass filters and um, kind of smooth out the process so it doesn't oscillate so much. Talk about process control theory, which is now we take our understanding of oscillations and, and dampening and we apply it to how do we control it with the controller. Uh, techniques of using a controller, PID, um, little model control, tuning the controller and the process and what's the best method to tune the process to get our best response. Um, then we're going to look at network communications and industrial control because today most uh, of our process control is moving towards uh, network systems, foundation field bus, uh, heart wireless, uh, Modbus, TCP, IP. So we need to look at that and understand communications. Almost everything is Ethernet or Ethernet IP. Uh, a lot of the valves and instrumentation and plants now are heading towards Ethernet IP as being the standard. It's, it's going to be our, our world ruling standard pretty soon. Ethernet IP. Everyone is going to Ethernet IP. It's a special protocol. It's not the Ethernet you use in your house. It's an Ethernet that has an encapsulated uh, protocol that uh, allows for timing to make sure that uh, by scheduling our traffic with these packets, we can tell what has priority and we schedule it through our switches and routers to make sure the information arrives in time to get a good response on a system so we don't lose control of the system or accidents could happen. Then we'll go on to study group five. We'll, we'll look at um, digital logic, applications of digital logic, gating, and how we use our, our digital gating we learned in school uh, to PLCs, relay logic, uh, and it, you're not limited to, a lot of people think it's just electronics. It has to do with pneumatics, hydraulics, all these use logic. And there's a lot of uh, switches and uh, logic controllers that go on with pneumatics as well. And they can be controlled in hydraulics, pneumatics can be controlled by PLCs as well. Uh, we'll move on to uh, motor controls and logic functions. Uh, We'll look at the fundamental starter, what the code says about starters, how to put it in, uh, the logic functions involved with controlling motors, uh, frequency drives, how frequency drives work, uh, how soft uh, starters work, why we use it, power factor correction on these. Uh, we'll talk about power factor correction, harmonic neutralization, um, which most of our power factor and harmonic neutralization will be concentrated in our next module of electrical systems. But we'll talk about the starter, uh, IEC and NEMA uh, our functions, what the code says, how to install them, how to size it, uh, how to protect our motors, how to protect our processes, uh, frequency drives, uh, what are the problems, what are the benefits, uh, as well as failures you need a backup typically uh, if it's a critical process we'll put a bypass contactor beside the frequency drive so it fails we get the process going. Um, then we'll look at applications of analog circuits and control systems. Okay, in, in process, almost everything uh, we're used to Ohm's law and equals I times R. And so we take our voltage divided by resistance, we have our current. Uh, the problem with that is you go or any distance, um, again, equals I times R, so we get a VD, V sub D, voltage drop across our line and we drop a lot of voltage with any distance, we drop a lot of voltage across our line. And so we're trying to measure precision signals, 0 to 100 percent. And we're trying to be within, you know, 0.1 or 0.5 percent minimum accuracy. And so you can't do it with voltage. So we have to go what's called a current loop. And we'll use a milliamp current loop, typically 4 to 20 milliamps. And the advantage of the milliamp loop is I can go miles without losing my signal. I don't care what the voltage drop is as long as enough voltage to overcome the resistance of the wire. We'll use a um, basically a current regulator or what they call a current pump. A lot of people call it a current regulator. Transmitters will be a transducer or change a process signal into a current signal and this transmitter will keep pumping out the current until it's exactly proportional to the percent signal. And as long as we get enough voltage, it doesn't matter how far it is, it keeps that constant current signal. 
And since we have a constant current signal, when we get to our controller uh, and we're measuring our, our data acquisition, we put a precision resistor so we get a precise voltage way off somewhere, 50 feet, 500 feet, 1,000 feet, a mile away. We get an exact voltage that is proportional to the process signal. And once we look at how that works in applications of analog circuits, uh, we can look at, uh, as well as with our digital, we come back in the process. It's very important you need to understand there's between current syncing and current sourcing, uh, how these devices work, because they wire differently and work differently, and some are safer than others. Okay, we'll move on to motion controllers, and we'll talk briefly about servo motors, how servo motors work, stepper motors work. We'll step in electrical systems. We're going to size power systems. We're going to look at how to protect them, how to do our voltage drop calculations, how to size our wires, what the code says to put it in, cable trays, conduits, uh, how you install these, uh, whether it's non-hazardous or hazardous, underground, above ground, uh, near class one, div one, which means uh, gases can be in there anytime. So just a slightest spark or heat can cause it to explode, including your motors. You have to protect your motors in a class one day one location because just the temperature rise in the motor can cause the atmosphere to blow up and blow up the plant. So we have to protect those. Uh, and we'll talk about UPS's backup systems, uh, problems with power quality. Uh, if we get a lot of drives and especially we get SCR controllers controlling big furnaces with big heaters, you get a lot of harmonics and these will actually reflect through the system and the voltage and uh, they'll come through the transformer and into your power supplies and it can cause uh, problems, uh, breakers tripping, uh, fuses blowing. So we'll talk about how to take care of that. Uh, next group will be, we need to talk about hydraulics and pneumatics. Um, so we, we use quite a bit, almost all process uses pneumatic. It used to be all pneumatic in the beginning. Now it's just the controller valves and uh, it's mostly for power signaling solenoids and we use some hydraulics even for screws or lifting. Uh, we use the principle of hydraulics to uh, uh, move heavy objects. Um, we're going to look at conveying systems and these are used in all kinds of plants. Conveying systems, you'll think of a conveyor as uh, a rubber conveyor and you're moving shingles or you're moving uh, boxes with bottles like you see on Laverne and Shirley, right? Uh, you see the Walmart and Amazon, you see all these conveyors going by. There's a lot more to it. There's all different kind of conveyors, all different kinds. We use them to move cars and hang cars or hang parts and go through the assembly line. We use them to go through our painting booths and there's, they raise uh, material up and put them in bins and pull them out of bins. Uh, you also have pneumatic conveying systems, which is how you move your powders and your flowers and your plastic pellets and you actually put a blower and blow them through a big conduit. And we'll talk about how to size that and how they work. Pneumatic conveying is used a lot in a lot of processes. Then we're going to cover uh, basic chemical processes and how the chemical processes work, different type of chemical processes, uh, different kind of equipment used in chemical processes, and how we apply this instrumentation and control to actually control processes, where we monitor it, where we place the instrumentation. Uh, we talk about the basic process systems and safety systems, how we do that. After we're finished there, we're going to go into uh, our standards and documentation. Okay, these products are big. They cover thousands of acres, you know. It can be it can be like from five acres to 2,500 acres. You don't know how big the plant is, uh, so it's not all just little buildings. Some can cover you know city blocks, all kinds, of, and they go up 150, 300 feet in air. And so we need to document where all these wires come from, where they go to, where all this instrumentation is, and you'll find out through you, as you hook up control loops, there might be something way up there and something way over there on the other side of the plant and these are connected together. And so it's hard to find out where these things are. But the documentation will tell us where to find them, what their elevation is, what their calibration is, what they're supposed to be measuring, uh, what the, we'll have wiring numbers. We have to document these wire numbers. 
and how to bring those into our DCSs where we have these distributed control systems and uh, we have to document what the terminals are. They'll go through, may go through one junction box or three junction boxes going through the plant and through cable trays to get back to the plant uh, to come to the DCS to a marshalling cabinet where we bring all of our connections together and these marshalling cabinets can be just like a small cabinet, maybe a six foot cabinet or it may actually encompass an entire room they'll look like closet doors, you pull them back there's all oh, terminals everywhere and you got a bunch of DCSs inside some plants are that big okay so you have to, a lot of documentation to understand how this works uh, for troubleshooting, for installation, uh, calibration, startup, and troubleshooting. Okay. Then we'll look at what is the safety system. Uh, the, the exams are focusing on probably 20% safety seal, which is safety integrity level and safety instrumentation systems, SIS, and a safety instrumented functions, SIF. We'll look at that and we'll talk about how to do these, how we apply these, and how to keep the system safe. They're basically a backup system. Uh, it's like, you know, jumping out of an airplane. In case your chute doesn't open, you have a backup chute. That's what we're doing to make sure you don't crash and burn. And then again, we'll move back towards uh, our codes. We're going to discuss numbers, numerous codes, um, NEC and NFPA. And uh, NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, uh, will be the bulk of our codes. They cover everything from installations, sprinklers, electrical systems, uh, panels, safety systems, life safety systems, uh, pressurizing systems, and uh, pressure relief systems, and uh, how to uh, assess what is a dangerous situation, what can explode, what kind of level of safety do you have to have in your installation so you don't have hazards. And then we'll basically look at putting it all together and actually how a whole plant is built and how we put this stuff in and where we place it and why we place it. And that's about it. You'll have to take your sample questions and test after that. And you should be prepped.